Numbers to get in at 466-377-6800-825-5865. Let's get to football. We, we love reading our friends at The Athletic, Andy Staples and his mailbag. Let, let's have that magic wand discussion. And uh, I'll put this to Nebraska fans. You can email chris at hailvarsity.com. If you wave a, a magic wand, and it's kind of the genie discussion, right? Uh, no three wishes here. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it three different ways. One, if you wave uh, the magic wand and, and Mr. College Football suddenly appears, we'll just say he's Beano Cook, the ghost of Beano. And, and Beano grants you the option to roll the dice the next two decades with your college football team. Or, all right, you can, you can win one championship and one championship only in 20 years. What are you picking? Are you going with give me one title in 20 years? It's better than zero. I like those. I like that guarantee better than, uh, than, than rolling the dice the next two decades, hoping that our program builds up, hoping that a Clemson or an Alabama or an Ohio State falls off. It's an interesting discussion. You know what? With, with Nebraska football growing up and watching and following them like I did, you know, you forget that, you know, one of the first things Coach Osborne said when they were celebrating that first national championship at the Devaney Center was, you know, I'd like to thank you, the fans, for your patience. A little pause, and then I guess, you know, about 22 years <laughs> worth of patience, right? But Nebraska had played, had played for several championships. They'd, they'd been right there as far as some of the top teams in college football. Looking at where Nebraska is at right now, let's use Nebraska as the example. That you don't know where things are going to go. Is a corner going to get turned? Is this build? Is this house going to start looking like, you know, the, 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 the $90,000 lot and, and $400,000 home you bought? Or is it still under construction in five years, in three years. We don't know, but if the ghost of Beano Cook grants you a wish and says, yep, yeah, we'll give you a title, uh, you're guaranteed one championship in 20 years, do you take it? I don't know uh, that I take it. I want to see how this build go goes. Uh, it, it's easy to say yes and say, yep, yeah, just chalk me up in five years, that that championship run, there you go, you, you have a season. and. You had uh, one one-hit wonder when it comes to college football and championships uh, in the last 30, 40 years. And, and it was, well, really two. Yeah, you got BYU in 84. They were great, but they didn't have a schedule worth a darn. And, and then you also have uh, the, uh, the Georgia Tech ramble and wreck that split the championship. They also beat Nebraska in the Citrus Bowl. They split with Colorado in 1990. They were a good team. But they kind of came out of nowhere to go unbeaten with one tie against North Carolina. But it really doesn't happen. You've got your three big dogs and, and then usually in Oklahoma or, or somebody else gets into that fourth spot. It'll soon be 12, we, we know. But you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take a pass on, on the championship uh, and uh, the ghost of Beano Cook per Andy Staples mailbag. You, may, you wave that magic wand. And you at least get a championship in the next 20 years. I hope and I think at some point Nebraska will get to a point where they're competing for titles again. See, I'll take the one in basketball, but in football, I don't think so. Just because the sport of college football is so unpredictable and, and a, a team can change so dramatic or drastically in four years. I mean, if you would have asked Alabama fans in 2001, will you take one championship over the next 20 years? I think a lot of them would have said yes with the state of the Alabama program 20 years ago. They would have said, yeah, one championship in the next 20 years sounds great. But guess what? They ended up getting six, seven. <laughs> I mean, and then you look at you don't want to sell yourself short. And if you go the same the same way, if you go ask Nebraska fans in 2001, say, hey, you get one championship over the next 20 years. I think most Nebraska fans would say no. But now with hindsight, 20 years ago, yeah. Yes. You think of the last 20 years. I mean, it's been 20 years since you played for one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If, if you would ask them, they would say no. But I think in hindsight, you would go back and say yes. So I'll, I'll say no for now just because college football is so unpredictable. Ne Nebraska could be a top 10 team in four years for all we know. It doesn't look like that at the moment. But college football is so ever-changing that I, I, I can't take the risk. As for college basketball, 
if you, if you give me a Nebraska basketball championship the next 20 years, only one of them, please give it to me. I'll take that. You want to talk about uh, your entire existence of frustration where you've had some good years, but for the most part, it's it's been uh, frustrating. Uh, more of that frustration today when you look at the, the schedule and uh, Nebraska and Creighton will square off at PBA, which is awesome. But it's going to be November 14th. Game three. Yes. And that, that needs to be a Saturday game at night. And it needs to be in early December. You need to have your sea legs under you if you're Creighton, if you're Nebraska, not slam it in as part of the Big Ten uh, Big East Challenge. I hate the timing of this. We, because Creighton will get better, potentially. Nebraska could get better. Or you just don't know. Um, it, it could be a loss that, or, or, or a win that means – Little or, or quite a bit, uh, based as the season goes on. Uh, we're great to be, uh, we're great to have you along here as Hale Varsity's on the road here. Uh, we are at uh, Zipline. Zipline is uh, downtown Omaha. We're right near TD Ameritrade Park, 721 North 14th. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Back here, getting ready for the College World Series elimination game tonight. Texas, Virginia. TD Ameritrade Park is all lit up. Now, a chance of storms, it wouldn't be the CWS if there weren't uh, potential for inclement weather. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herba, Will Wilson back at our ESPN studios and uh, just a man that knows uh, Omaha and knows June. We welcome in the uh, former head coach at Oregon State, three-time national champ, Pat Casey. And coach, it's uh, wonderful to spend time with you here. We're here at Zipline. We have that cold beer for you. And I know you've been watching. How, how have you enjoyed the series so far? Well, you know, it's been pretty exciting. I'll tell you what. I felt for Dave last night and the Stanford Cardinal, that's for sure. Um, but, man, it's, um, it's good to see teams like North Carolina State go in there and do some things that they've done. And, uh, of course, the, the World Series is always exciting as heck. And, and so there, you never know what's going to happen. And, and uh, it, that's holding to be true right now. Coach Pat Casey's with us. Coach, what do you say to your kids in that moment? I mean, you have, you've, you've seen all types of wins and all sorts of losses in the game of baseball, and Stanford and, and Ace Beck is on the hill, and he's cruising, and credit Vandy for never saying die, but also there, there's another part of that equation, and, and it's the Stanford kids, and they were just still uh, shell-shocked from it, even you know an hour after the game, still on the field in disbelief. Yeah, you know, it, it's really tough. I, I think that the situation and your club, you know, kind of dictates how you handle that. You know, if you got older guys, you know, if you got guys um, that are young and you know, you know, pretty much that they know that you trust that this game isn't going to find us, guys. I mean, we had a bad inning. We, 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 but, you know, we got someplace where a lot of people didn't think we were going to, we were going to get. And we had this this game, but you know what? It's the beauty of the game of baseball. And I'll never forget this. In 2012, we lost at LSU in a regional. And I said, man, with the way you guys played tonight, it's the greatest loss I've ever experienced in my life. And it's going to propel you to the World Series next year. And it did. So I'm sure Dave had some words of of um, inspiration and encouragement that were, were mixed in with, hey, I get it, man. You should be disappointed. Uh, nobody Nobody would blame you for being disappointed, but – we're not going to walk out of here um, and be defined by an inning. We're going to walk out of here by a club that made it to the, to the World Series because we fought and we battled and we scrapped and we found a way to make it happen. Talking with Coach Pat Casey here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, and Coach, we've now had five straight nights of one-run games here at the College World Series. 
and I'm just trying to find the, the, the source for this exciting baseball. And, and the, the number one thing I keep coming back to is the fact that a lot of these teams played most of the season with limited or no fans in the stands. So do you think now that they're out in front of 20, 25,000 fans at a night game at TD Ameritrade Park, do you think that that is impacting how the game is played? Like how much do fans uh, impact the results of these games, at the college world series? Well, you know, I think it can. I mean, I think, you know, every time I played in the world series, I always felt like, regardless of whether it was accurate or not, I always felt like, you know, um, we're playing somebody and half the people here root for them, half the people rooting for us because they're just making a whole bunch of noise, you know. And uh, and and so um, I think it depends on the team. I think it depends on how much, uh, how big a crowd you played in before. I think, uh, you know, I don't think Beck was af- affected by the crowd last night personally. You know, he's a guy that's been around. He's he's been there. Um, but I do think that that I do think that that's a great question and, and something that that hasn't been asked a lot. Hey man, these guys have been out playing in some of these people in these crazy states where they won't let anybody in a plane in front of uh, you know like a center squad game. You know how has that impacted them? And um, you know uh, if if I had a younger club, I would think that that might have something to do with it. But um, I, I just think that baseball is an unforgiving game. I think baseball will. Uh, humble anybody at any time in any place and if you don't respect the game and you don't respect it it can happen to you it happens more often than it should Pat Casey's with us a few minutes here just a a foul ball away from TD Ameritrade Park you're at Zipline <laughs> uh, downtown uh, Omaha 721 North 14th Street coach you're going to get back here and we're going to sit down all right and I know sooner rather than later I hope we know last time we talked we were talking about, uh, you know, just the, the, the greatness of, of college baseball and, and, and the run uh, that, that Nebraska went on. I'm interested to get your, your thoughts on the, the topic of momentum and, and just what it's like to be a part of a really good team, but a team that's, that is uh, second to none. But you also add that component of getting hot. You get momentum. Can you speak to that a little bit? I sure can. You remember our club in 2007. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, we got hot. We went, uh, we lost that first game in the regional in Virginia, never lost again. And um, I think, I think North Carolina state is a club that you could without question talk about how hot they are at the end of the season. And, um, you know, Vandy's been really, really consistent. I think throughout the year as well as Stanford's been pretty consistent, but, you know, I think if you look at Virginia, and you look at North Carolina State, both those clubs um, have really gone on a run here at the end of the year. Everybody expected Vandy to be there and probably Mississippi State. Um, and, of course, Arkansas um, was good enough to be there for sure. And when you run into one of those clubs that doesn't care who's supposed to be there and they just go out and play and they play loose, sometimes those things happen. And, um, you know, I actually spoke to Elliott Avent the day after they they got beat 22. I said, listen, you got to get some better guards on that. You're going to have to block a little better so you get the end zone. <laughs> and he laughed. And then I told him a story about getting beat 18 to 1 one night and walking home from the field instead of taking the bus. And we came back and won 10 in a row. So uh, we had fun with it. But, it's, you know, it's college baseball, man. It's, it's, it's what it's supposed to be. And I'll tell you what, until – um, you know, three minutes left in the game, uh, Van- Vanderbilt was eliminated. And, um, you know, it, it matters the most when it's the most important. And um, when it mattered the most, you know, you got to give Vandy credit. Um, you know, they can talk about a walk and they can talk about this, but the kid got a hit um, when, when, you know, when he needed to. The kid got on base when he needed to. They put the ball in place when they needed to. So, you know, there's just so many things that can happen, and, and that's not um, – you know, that's not something that, um, you know, you can sit back and look and say, hey, I'm, we're Stanford. We've got our best guy in the mound. He's dealing two outs, nobody on. Then there's two outs and one and two on the hitter. And the next thing you know, you know, like you said, you're wondering what happened. So um, that's why they don't the, – the, the, whoever invented these games, you know, they gave baseball the great blessing of saying there is no, there is no running the clock out. You can't take a knee. You can't run out of bounds. You can't you can't give it to your best player. You can't call it. You know, it's it's baseball, man. You got to get the last out, and and that that at times is the toughest one to get. Coach Pat Casey's with us here on Hale Varsity, and, and Coach, 
um, to, just to make it to the College World Series, you have to have such a complete team. And, and now I'm looking at Vandy, who is trying to make it out of the loser's bracket. They got a game against NC State tomorrow night. And when you're, they're doing that, I mean, to have guys like Lighter and Rocker on, on the bump, is that enough of an equalizing force that they can get them out of the loser's bracket, which is a, a pretty tall task to ask for a team? Oh, there's no question. They got enough firepower to get out of the out of the losers bracket. I mean, they're they're loaded. I mean, you know, you talk about kid coming in last night so at the end of the game throwing a slider, 88, 89 miles an hour. Um, I'm assuming Coomer's ready to go uh, tomorrow night. You know, um, that's not a bad call. So um, they're 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 balanced. They they can they can score. They can hurt you. They've been. I think they were the number one offensive club in the SEC. Um, they got pitching depth. They're experienced. There's no doubt that they can come out and lose this bracket. And we've done that a couple times. And we also lost um, to LSU, you know, and we had a, we had a, uh, had won the first two games to set till Friday. So, um, you know, there's, there's anything is possible in baseball. And, um, you know, we, we may be surprised. I'd be surprised if we're not surprised again for the end of this, this tournament. How's that? We'll see how things work out tonight. Texas uh, and Virginia, Pat Casey, legendary uh, championship coach uh, from Oregon State, three-time national champion. Coach, uh, I wanted to, to ask you, your name had been floated around with, with LSU. How comfortable are you right now, or are you still maybe looking and wondering here about getting back in? You know, right now I'm just real comfortable talking to you. You know, I feel so good right now. <laughs> I, that's fine. It's the best that's thing fine. that's happened to me all day long, man. You know, so um, it's 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 a great game. I'm glad I got to be part of it. If I'm ever part of it again, it'll be a great game as well. But right now, I'm just comfortable and and, um, and I'm enjoying watching it, like you guys are watching it. And um, I promise you that I'm going to get back there and tilt one with you. And so I will, man, for sure. And uh, had some things not come up um, uh, here. I would have been back there this year, but um, unfortunately I got some things that have to be taken care of. And so um, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to make it this year, but um, I know that you guys are going to be roaring uh, for, for forever. So, man, I can roll in there anytime I want. All right. IPA stout or, or uh, lager. You know what? I'm going to go with the lager. I'm going to go with the lager to start with. Might even, I might even shake down to a Pilsner or something like that. I'm pretty versatile. You know, I was from a small town of, you know, what five thousand, and then it got to ten thousand, and then to fifteen thousand. You know, so um, when Coors Light came out, we were jumping up and down. You know, and, uh, <laughs> Pat Casey's with us, uh, great coach at Oregon State, three-time national champ, and uh, and knows Omaha well. Five tool beer drinker. Five, five, tool five tool beer drinker. Uh, I've never heard that. That's pretty good, man. I haven't been drafted yet, but I pulled a draft. So, uh, <laughs> uh, coach, last thought here. What, what's your reaction been to to Major League Baseball and, and some of the pitchers' reaction with the umpires having to check them for for substances for foreign substances? Well, you know, I think that I I need to be better schooled as to how 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 egregious it was, you know what I mean? Sure. I don't think that there's, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that the baseball has to be doctored up in order for a, a guy to throw it where he wants to throw it. I'm sure they got used to that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that they enjoyed that. I, I, I see the strikeouts going up unbelievable and the spin rate going up unbelievable. So maybe it's a good thing. I'm not sure that, you know, I, I, however they're handling it, I think some pitchers are pretty cool with it. They're just going, yeah, man, hey, I don't use it here. Check my hat, whatever. I think the umpires are just doing what they're told to do. I sure. think that um, – I think there's probably, you know, like everything, you know, I think it's, it was probably a good idea to look at it. Um, but I'm not in the game enough to tell you that it was egregious enough that they should go to the extent or they shouldn't. I just know that any time that you use something to alter – the game, it's always been frowned upon. I mean, I don't care how you look at it. Now, if you get it on the field, you know, like if you can steal a sign from second base from their catcher, that's all That's all good. If you can get anything in uniform, but when, you know, when you, when you get out of that, it's probably something you got to look at. And, you know, we've looked at methods of sign stealing probably 25 years ago. We never would have dreamed somebody was going to do. And um, same thing here. You know, maybe if you don't slow it down a little bit, pretty soon, some guy comes out with another substance and another substance and another substance. And, and so I, 
you know, I'm okay with it. I mean, it, it, it doesn't really matter to me. My fastball's below 90 right now anyway, so <laughs> I probably, it's not going to, it's not going to affect my spin rate. You know what I mean? So, uh, I, I, I'm okay with it. Pat Casey's with us. Coach, you take care. We'll do this again. Thanks for your time today. Absolutely. You guys are the best, man. Have a good time. And we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Great to have you back here. Hale Varsity Radio Road Show Thursday. We're here at Zip Line, downtown Omaha, 721 North 14th. And uh, the old rain has not gone away. It's actually arrived here as we're just a foul ball away here from TD Ameritrade Park. Zip line. We're up here in the loft. Just talked with three-time champion coach Pat Casey from Oregon State over the years. And uh, he's comfortable hanging out with us. So that was a no to, uh, to the coaching gigs. Uh, we'll check in with Bill Dolman next hour. Brandon Vogel, the Pride of Chicago. Danny Burke will join us. You can jump in at 466 377 800-825-5865. Uh, you can email Chris at com. So the uh, Pro Football Focus has come out with their top 10 hardest schedules in college football. Number one. Arkansas. You look at what they're at, where they're trying to go. They're in the SEC West. Yeah, no, no bueno. Nebraska in at number two. Elijah and Mississippi State comes in at six. We talked with the Pirate yesterday. Coach Leach, Indiana's in at seven. Auburn and Ole Miss, eight and nine. You have Purdue in at four. Uh, that's their crossover schedule as well. And South Carolina. Man, doesn't the don't, don't the spur your years feel like a thousand years ago when they're going eleven and two? It feels like every year they had a five year stretch of of of, a, of an incredible run. But as we look at this schedule, and we'll dive into more things with Brandon Vogel with uh, with Nebraska football. How hung up are you as a Nebraska fan about the schedule? Yes, it's it's there. It's real. We, we've highlighted and detailed just the difficulty, the ranking, for, for goodness sake. But does it? do you care? Do you care how hard the schedule is with Nebraska? How much are you applying that to what you see on, on Saturdays here this fall when it comes to your, your expectations? Are your expectations down because of the schedule or are your expectations down because – you know what, Nebraska's been Nebraska's worst enemy on the field the last two years. That's really kind of the conversation we need to have. Yeah, Michigan's got a lot of talent. Ohio State's great. You're playing two playoff teams, right? You're playing two likely playoff teams in Ohio State and Oklahoma, fine. But you've not been out-recruited by anybody else on your schedule, aside from Michigan. You just haven't been. You haven't been out recruited by Northwestern. You haven't been out recruited by Wisconsin. I mean, they're they're recruiting high. Usually, is a mid thirty class. Northwestern comes in at fifty. Indiana, for God's sake, uh, was barely a top sixty recruiting team. But man, they found the right guys and they got developed. Schedule is not easy, and I think, and we'll get into this with Vogel. I think the, the, the psyche part is super key, right? The psyche and, and how do you respond if, if, you're, if you just get outclassed for four quarters by two teams that are probably going to be playing in the college football playoff in Oklahoma and Ohio State. How do you respond from that? Uh, schedule is, hey, man, I look at it as an opportunity for Nebraska uh, with what they've been doing on the recruiting trail, with what they've got built uh, depth-wise, and I'm anxious to see him go play good football. And if you get beat in a tough fight game where there's maybe two penalties and someone else makes a play on you, so be it. So be it. I'm not going to light torches if, if you fall to, to Wisconsin 27-24. If it's hard fought and just a nail-biter, son of a gun, right? And, and I know that's 
easy to say and you're in the moment and you have passion and you're a fan, but man, uh, they just got to look better. And, and if they fall, how they fall. Now, these other teams, Elijah, that you're air quote better than on paper and recruiting, you need to be better on better than on the field. And that's to me, uh, people not named Iowa and Wisconsin in the West. See, and I, I don't see a, a schedule talk as anything more than off-season fodder, really. Whenever you look at the top 10 here of whatever the hardest schedules that they have listed are, when you get to the end of the season and then you go back and evaluate who had the hardest schedule from an end-of-year perspective, it's going to be probably 10 different teams in there. You don't know what you're going to get out of teams until September rolls around. Yes, Oklahoma is built up as being this great team, what have you. You could have an injury in fall camp or two injuries in fall camp that completely derail your season season and completely take away the bite. Are they still probably a top 25 team with a couple injuries? Probably, but they're not this big vaulted giant that we've built them up to be this offseason. Same with Ohio State. Same with any of the teams in the Big Ten West. One or two bad injuries in uh, fall camp or early in the season can completely change what you're looking at for a trajectory of your season. So the only way that I see the, the strength of schedule talk is, is as a way to temper my own expectations as a Nebraska fan. I can look at it and say, yes, we have some very difficult teams on the schedule. I can look at it and say, if this was a, a Bo Pelini 2010, 2011 team, they're probably going 10 and two, nine and three. That, that's at, at the end of the day, I can look at it that way and say, now what does this team do compared to a Bo Pelini team? But this, that's just off season talk. It, it's not going to matter until you roll around in September and it's actually game week. And you're looking at what a team's putting out there. You know what? And, and listen, let's see who you, who you fall to and who you beat and how do they do, right? That could, that could do a lot. If, if someone's overinflated, say you get the, the Sam Bradford team of, of Oklahoma, they got whacked by BYU, right? Coming off the 08 title game appearance, good Oklahoma football team, but not good in respect to, what they had been, right? And that's playing for, for a championship the year before against Florida. You know, the team that kind of comes to my mind when I think of a really solid year and a, a good football team, but they finished eight and four, I think of the, the 2017 Auburn team. Perfect example, murderous schedule. And, and Auburn's had brutal schedules before, and they had that magic run to, to where they played for the championship and just fell to Florida State and, and Jameis. That was a 2013 team. But you fast forward here to Gus's team that lost to Scott Frost, Central Florida team. That Central Florida team was damn good. That Auburn team beat Alabama. They beat Georgia. Both teams that ended up playing for the national championship. The problem with Auburn is they fell to an LSU and they probably lost to an Ole Miss. Right. It was that loaded of a schedule. You can look at it this way going into 2021 for Nebraska, where, OK, it's possible to stub your toe against or stub your toe. It's possible to stub your toe against the Northwestern. Hey, they've been a division champ. They're not chopped liver. Uh, Minnesota could have another eight, nine win season. You lose to them on the road. Tight ball game. No shame in that. Same with the Wisconsin. I think it's the Purdue's and the Illinois's. Uh, on on the schedule that that you're sick of eking out or or even falling to, uh, and and then your your group of five teams, uh, those have been frustrating because Nebraska's had way too many of those losses uh, in the, in the not too distant uh, past, and then there's Michigan State, a team that's also kind of in rebo rebuild mode with you. You should go there. You should take care of business against them because theoretically you're further along with better players. Uh, than, than what Mel Tucker is in his second season. But at the end of the day, you don't know what Mel Tucker has. You don't know what Pat Fitzgerald has at Northwestern. He's got one of the youngest teams he's ever had. So while we can talk about this till the, the sun goes down, it, all it comes down to is beating that next team on your schedule. Going one to know every single week is all that matters. It does not matter how good or the, the media builds up a team across me. You know, reality or excuse when you look at this 2021 schedule when, uh, when it comes to results. We'll wind down hour one from Zipline, downtown Omaha, next. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back here at Zipline Roadshow Thursday, College World Series. The rain has passed. The streets are damp, but it'll still be baseball time in 
you know what, Bebo could be sent home. Texas, Virginia, an elimination game. We're back here on Monday to kick off the uh, best of three national championship series. We thank our friends here at Zipline for hosting us. 721 North 14th Street. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Will Wilson back at our ESPN studios. We're all straightened out. And uh, what a fun first hour. We're talking, waving that magic wand. Would you take a just one championship? If the ghost of Beano Cook would wave the wand and say, here you go. Here's a title. And God love Beano. I miss talking to him. It's actually not a bad impression. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> he was on enough. He, he'd spend hours talking about the time that him and Devaney go to the uh, – Tam O'Shanner, mm, mm. <laughs> when he'd visit. Uh, that's cool. Zipline tomorrow, if you're coming up for baseball tomorrow, they have got your uh, sour, if you love it, the peach cobbler sour. And that sounds, I love peach cobbler, and I would love trying a peach cobbler beer. There I said it. Uh, pretty incredible. So the question is, is it more peach or is it more cobbler? Well, if you have the mix, it's perfect. If you have can, can we can we bring Will in on this? Get his, or do we are we jinxing things here? Hey, oh, I think we can bring we can bring in Will. Okay, yeah, Will, are you going to try the peach cobbler sour next time you're at Zipline? Uh, most definitely. There's a lot of beers I got to try. I, I'm going to try it. I I got to be honest though. I've never even had you know peach cobbler pie. What? Hold on. You the, you've never had the dessert? Yeah, that's correct. Well. Yeah, are you are you not American? Oh, I'm American. <laughs> Will, are you uh, are, are you bound in, in leather and locked in a in a in a trunk in the basement somewhere, buddy? I mean, what, what's the deal, brother? Not at all. I just haven't had that much pie. Uh, apple pie is, you know, maybe pumpkin. I think that's all I've really gotten to. You got to come to my house for Thanksgiving. We got the whole pie layout. We got at least five pies every Thanksgiving. Listen, you leave a plate open, I'll be there, man. There's, there's two pies that belong, and the rest are negotiable. Pecan and key lime. It's mm. all you need. That's all you need is either key lime or pecan. Yeah. Well, mm, see, pecan, pecan, whatever. It's subjective. Grandpa, grandpa. I, I, I like the pecan pie pick, but you're missing out on okay, – they're, they're interchangeable for me. It's the coconut cream or the banana cream. Sure. Got to have a good coconut cream or banana cream pie. Key lime pie is undefeated. That's that's it. I will challenge anyone. It, it's it's incredible. What, what's the most overrated pie, and why is it apple pie? Is it well, not apple pie? For me, apple pie is just it's. What it's, do you mean? It's man. great. No, it's great, but do you put cheese on it? Oh cheese? wow, that's 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 questioning it. Right we'll, there. we'll bring Vogel in here, Brandon Vogel next, because he's also a food connoisseur. It's it's incredible. Watch the movie. Thank you for smoking. Okay, it's kind of an indie. It's great. We're talking dark, what, dark comedy. What type of cheese? Is it like a slice of American cheese or what? Cheddar. Oh. Then you melt it, and it goes incredible with the apple. Usually, I'm more of a, an ice cream on my apple pie. Uh-huh. And I've not tried the cheese, but I hear it's it's undefeated. All right, that, in I fact, I've had a, a grilled cheese with a little apple and cheese in there with a little touch of bacon. No, you, you can't sell me on it. It's No. We, 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 we've got to figure it out. We'll Google that during the break. Uh, cheese and apple pie. Hour two from Zipline downtown Omaha. CWS Roadie with Hale Barson. For your nation. Insight. Opinion. Expertise. With the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466- ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to an It's Hour 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery Roadshow Thursday. Second time up here at the College World Series. Zipline, kind enough to have us here. 721 N Street, uh, I should say 721 North 14th. Slap me, read my own writing. 721 North 14th in Omaha. Now I've got the the Zipline Beer Hall in Lincoln down the road from me. And, of course, the great location on West O. But uh, if you're coming up for the CWS, so if you're coming up to watch Texas go goodbye like a good Nebraskan, then you need to stop by Zipline. We're going to have that peach cobbler sour coming out tomorrow. And a full day of baseball tomorrow here at TD Ameritrade. The uh, rain and clouds and 
nastiness has moved out for now. A little sprinkle to cool you off. Now, weatherman Elijah here to my right uh, is, is looking at the radar going, eh, Schmidt, you're driving. <laughs> you're driving home. I'm getting my uh, my Capital City forecast voice getting getting ready yeah, for that. Do, yeah, Mr. Hat uh, that does the uh, the weather updates at 550 for us uh, from South Park. Yeah, Mr. Hat <laughs> is, is, is a classic. Uh, a guy who's put in a ton of work with the rest of the Hale Varsity staff. Uh, has done an incredible job for yet another uh, award-winning yearbook. Brandon Vogel, managing editor, HaleVarsity.com and magazine. At Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter is where you follow him. And uh, please get his book with John Cook, Dream Like a Champion. Vogues, we're getting ready for a little baseball tonight. Are you uh, rocking your Virginia hat? <laughs> I, so. I've owned a lot of hats in the over the years, and I don't know that Virginia ever made it into the the rotation. So I might have to head out and see if I can get one before tonight. I mean, boy, you're gonna have a tough time topping topping last night's game just for excitement. But uh, College World Series tends to find a way. You know, there was a run, and we all had a man where you had the uh, the white lids when we were in college and they were like the three bar hats with the team logo and it says university of right and and then you also had the fitted hats and it seemed like the the alternative to, to nebraska at least in college or late high school everybody had a cow hat people were rocking either cow hats or the or the virginia hat with the with the the v or the the the, the two swords you know the who's so, yeah. you know, Virginia was, was popular. I think more of my brother's high school slash college uh, buddies had the Virginia gear going. But, you know, there's just not a lot of folks that wear Texas stuff around here, even if it's given to them, folks. <laughs> that's, that's true. I, I think the, the Virginia hat had, had a little bit of uh, extra cachet because, because of the sort of alternate nickname of, of the Who's. So that was mm-hmm. good. And, and the cow one on, on the, you know, the classic three bar hat was interesting yes. because they would actually use the cow logo. You know, everybody else just got block letters that read Huskers or Buckeyes or whatever. But for the cow one, I think, I think you got the actual cow logo. So it sort of stood out in a, a sea of three bar hats, but still a classic from, uh, from the game. Dirty confession before we get to football and baseball. I about pulled the trigger at one point in my life on one of those gray Ohio State hats with the red O. Little did I know, 15 years later, uh, they would be stomping out people in the Big Ten, and it would have been code red, but bar of soap in sock time for me had I ever worn an Ohio State hat. But Ohio State was linked arms in arm with Nebraska on the, the whole race to get college football back to the Big Ten last fall. So there, there's a little Nebraska bit of unity. was the fullback. I also wanted nothing about getting dirty. Uh, Brandon Vogel's with us. That's Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt. Uh, We're here at Zipline, downtown Omaha, uh, and uh, 721 North 14th here, just right across from TD Ameritrade Park. So, Vogues, uh, how did you take the Adrian V. Taylor screw up last night? Uh, Innocent mistake by an intern or... Dear God, the world doesn't know Nebraska's starting quarterback's name. Um, it's somewhere between the two. Uh, <laughs> honest enough, mistake. Uh, you know, it uh, it, it happens. Uh, but it also the more conspiracy part of my brain is kind of like, yeah, probably not a great sign for how much the nation at large has had to pay attention to Nebraska football over the past couple of years, um, that, that it happened. So it's, it's somewhere between those two polar opposites, I guess. So, but yeah. it, was, it was nice to see Adrian it looked like he was enjoying his sweet, sweet silly throwback and, uh, looked like he was having a good time. Now, Brandon, if you were to be up on TV at the College World Series and they were to mess up your first name, are there any other Vogels out there you, you wish to be confused with? I, I guess I don't even – how popular the last name is Vogel? Um, I mean, I, I feel like it's fairly popular among the, you know, two, three, four generations ago German immigrants. Um, but I you're still the most famous Vogel right a- now? 
Well, I, I wouldn't go that far, but I, I'm having <laughs> trouble. Like the, 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 there was a Carl Vogel who I believe was from North Platte. who went on, who's a really good basketball player who went on to play basketball at Colorado state. But honestly, um, I know there's another Brandon Vogel out there who I believe is a professor of something or other at, at Bowling Green or, or someplace like that. But yeah, we, we just, we haven't, we haven't made a ton, a ton of impact, I guess, now that you've forced me to really think about it. <laughs> Man, it's Elijah's question. He's been loading that one up for an hour. Uh, yeah. <laughs> really, really set me spiraling, Elijah. So, <laughs> Bogues, uh, I want to thought on on what what do you look at and what what do you process when you look at Nebraska's strength of schedule? Uh, Pro Football Focus put out their top ten. Nebraska comes in two. Purdue four. Indiana seven. So the Big Ten well represented. Do you, do you let the strength of schedule affect your expectations for Nebraska, or do you say, okay, bring it on all the better. Let's really see how this thing is in year four. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it certainly I, – I think it eliminates the chance of, okay, if we're all thinking, you know, Nebraska, Nebraska needs to go to the postseason at minimum, which I, and I feel is pretty fair – it kind of eliminates the chance to get there cheaply. And, and I think that's a good thing for the overall progress of the program um, if they're to make it. You know, strength schedule is also I, – I look at this, and it's interesting because there's, there's not a ton of like, well, yeah, it looked like the second toughest schedule, but turns out – I mean, who's going to fall off? Like Buffalo – probably isn't what its power ranking says, just given the coaching change and then the attrition it had uh, post that coaching change. But there's not a lot of teams on there where I think, oh, yeah, that's not who they're really going to be. Maybe, maybe Northwestern a little bit, depending on, you know, what pro football focus used to, to calculate that strength of schedule. You know, I mean, we've talked about Northwestern before. Great, great program, kind of unassailable. I just think they're they're due for a little bit of a, a downturn, just given the amount that they lost. So, but it's, it's even hard with that one, given the series history between Northwestern and Nebraska, because somehow, some way, it always ends up being a uh, a twelve round bout between those two. Brandon Vogel's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Brandon, I think the game that really boosts Nebraska's strength of schedule rating is that, that non-conference game against Oklahoma. And as we move forward towards an era of a 12-team college football playoff, do you think we're still going to have Nebraska scheduling those marquee non-conference matchups like we've used to been seeing the, the past 10 years? Because now, you know, all you need to do is win your conference, and you have a, a, I mean, you have an automatic bid into the college football playoff now. You, you don't need to have uh, as many quality wins on your schedule. Yeah, when your conference and as a Power Five team, you're you're almost certainly in, and when you division in a Power Five league, and you're probably in that discussion on on the final rankings day for the most part. So I, that is the one thing that gives me pause with with playoff expansion is it really takes the incentive away to have those those kind of matchups. And, you know, as we talk about, uh, well, do you have to shorten the season if some teams are going to play 15, 16, 17 games? Uh, if you do that, then I'm worried that the Nebraska-Oklahoma home-and-homes are, are all but gone because Nebraska is going to want two home games. It's not going to be able to get Oklahoma just to come to, to Lincoln without paying a return visit. So, so that is one part of it that – concerns me about the potential for playoff expansion. I, I like 95% of it. I'm all in on that. But I do worry that these kind of big non-conference matchups between traditional powers or just even two power five teams are, are endangered a little bit. I think some of the leagues that, that are, well, not Big Ten or SEC will continue non-conferences to kind of boost – perhaps that argument for a second team, okay, or maybe a third, and maybe you, maybe you see a continuation of the non-conference showdowns week three or the air quote neutral site, Georgia Peach Bowl sites, Bama versus somebody, right? Um, so you have a, a, a third argument for the, uh, the Big Ten of the SEC, and there's been years where you can absolutely take a third SEC and absolutely take a third 
Big Ten. I want to go back to the, the, the playoff question, though. And, Vogues, how do you think this, this affects divisions in the future? I meant to get that question to you last week. We didn't do it. But now we're, we're talking strength of schedule here. If I'm the Big Ten, I keep divisions uh, because, listen, Penn State's been runner-up a lot in some great showdowns against Ohio State. A lot of years they'd have been in. But you've had a good enough Iowa or Wisconsin team to to also be represented uh three big tens in, in that field of 12 do you think the big 10 messes with it or do you think they they just go round robin and take their two top I, I, i'd be surprised if they would mess with it right away um like feel it out see how it plays out i mean i know we've all kind of gone back and looked at what this could look like if you started it in 2014 um, but, and, and that's the choice I would make in my, in my mind, like this highlights division play, like a division title has been really meaningless for the most part. Like people are putting up banners for, for division titles. I mean, they may, but nobody really cares about it. Um, but now it's, it's kind of like, yes, it gives you the opportunity to win the conference, which should still be meaningful. And I think is, um, but like, like I said, if, if you're a big 10 West division winner, most of the time you're going to be either in the top 12 already or like knocking on the door to the point where you could get there with, with one more win. So I think it, it really highlights, you know, winning the big 10 West now means something um, or, or any of the other divisions. The, the only hesitancy, I think the thing that I could see maybe forcing the big 10 to take a harder look at it are, are those years where, okay, maybe it's clear that Ohio State's the best team in the conference and Penn State's number two. But if that West Division team is kind of close enough in the rankings, do do they knock out a Penn State? Do they prevent you from getting a third team? So maybe you're taking your first and third best teams. You could see that unfolding sometimes too. And and if that happens often enough, I could see conferences taking another look at, at division play in general. Brandon, we got about two minutes left here. So my question to you, if it's not a, not a long or difficult question, but I'm not sure how long or difficult your, your answer might be, and that's are the Big Ten East and West equal right now when, when you look at football? Is there an equal amount of competition in each division? Um, they're, they're closer than people typically give them credit for. And I think a lot of this comes down to perception of the team starting the season. Um, you know, preseason polls aren't, aren't going away. You can't outlaw them because people would just do them on their own. Um, but when, when you have the West, and I mean, it's been a little bit different with the run that Wisconsin's been on, because uh, they have traditionally started in the top 10 these past couple of years. But <laughs> the West is always just it, – it, it's grouped in kind of 15 to 25. Like, you know, that's where we'll slot Northwestern. And that's where we'll put <laughs> Iowa most years. And it, and it doesn't, and it, you know, it, it doesn't reflect how difficult it is to win that, that division. I mean, I think top to bottom, the West is tougher. The East is different because it has Ohio State. And, you know, they're just, they run the show in, in the Big Ten. And Penn State's been close, but... I think the West is more of a meat grinder than the East. There's less fat uh, is probably the way to put it. You nailed that, and and you're right. And it sounds crazy out loud to say, well, the West is tougher. It just comes down to being top heavy, you know, with because Michigan's been off. Here's the thing, folks. Your argument's so money because the West has taken down Ohio State or Penn State or Michigan. The, the Minnesotas, the Iowas, the Wisconsins have beaten the East's best, just not Ohio State on a regular basis. What's funny is who, who slayed Ohio State? Uh, Iowa and Purdue. And, and that, that's not necessarily that Iowa team. That Iowa team was good, but the Purdue team was, you know, uh, punching uh, above their weight and had a great night. Yeah, and, and, and that's kind of what it is like week in, week out when you're playing in the West. You know, because neither of those teams beat Ohio State, won the division that year. Um, you know, it's it's just a it's it's the half of the division where really every week you can look at it and be like, yeah, no matter how good the team is, they could lose this game. And I think that's the difference. You know, and the addition of Rutgers and Maryland is, while those teams have 
had their had their moments, not so much Rutgers. Um, you just don't have that week in, week out major, I think, in the East. Brandon Vogel. Vogue, you take care. Thanks for jumping in with us today. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for hanging out. Hale Varsity Road Show here. College World Series, Virginia and Texas. Folks are filing in to the ballpark. It's still gray and cloudy and damp, but the rain has stopped. I know storms are in the area or making their way west from North Platte uh, to, uh, to Kearney and, and maybe Omaha. Uh, we uh, hope to get baseball in and hope to see Texas go home tonight. Uh, just cl- quite frankly saying horns down. Uh, if you're a Nebraskan, it's not very uh, professional, but so what? We're here at Zipline. Be at Zipline if you're coming up for the doubleheader tomorrow. And, of course, uh, potential weekend baseball. And we'll be back here Monday to start the championship series. Many thanks to Pat Casey. Last hour to breaking down. CWS ball with us. Bill Dolman is with us as the pride of Fairbury joins us on a Thursday. Uh, Billy D, we needed to move you up in the lineup, brother. Thanks for a few minutes. Uh, how are you today? I'm great. I appreciate uh, you um, uh, starting my suspension tomorrow so I could be with you uh, today. So it's uh, <laughs> good to be here. We told you not to use spider tack and you said, screw it. I'm going to put some on my belt. I'm going to put a little jalapeno on my my thumb and i'm gonna rub my nose and i'm gonna get three to four more inches drop on my curveball well i just think it's great that rob manfred is putting the the his his iron fist of rule on major league baseball while the astros continue to polish their 2000 what was it 17 or 18 (laughs) world series trophy like oh we're gonna we're gonna show baseball now like okay how much is this messing with the analytics of, of the major leagues because all of a sudden you decided you're going to crack down on, on, on pitchers who have been dominant. And I, it, it, to me, it, it's just an, an embarrassing chapter of, of baseball. And all of a sudden he's acting like, you know, he's got this iron fist and command of the game when he, it's been out of control since he took over. And uh, Bill, it's a little closer to you, but I saw today that the uh, the MLB released the All Star Game uniforms, which are absolutely hideous, in my opinion. I saw a tweet that said, "If Rob Manfred was trying to destroy the game of baseball from the inside, would he be doing anything differently?" And honestly, I can't think of anything. I I think he's been a disaster for the game, to be honest with you. And I, I'm not sure who's in charge. And I know that they've got you know some labor issues that are coming up here. Um, I don't know if it's this off season or the, the following one in, in a year and a half, but I, I, I don't, how do you have any can, you know, any confidence that baseball is going to get its, its ship righted before it, you know, it finds an iceberg. And I, I'm just not convinced of it. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I love baseball. I love, you know, I, I grew up loving the major leagues. And as you know, everybody knows Southern Nebraska and Southern California are very similar. And that's why I'm a Dodger fan. <laughs> but I try to watch major league baseball now and I have no idea what my brothers and sisters in the booth are saying anymore. And I don't know who they're talking to. I, it's one of the, the joys of watching the college world series and a guy like, and, and listen, it's I think Tom Hart is one of the great announcers in the country right now. and is a true voice of college baseball, but I can understand the college game more than I can a major league baseball game because they're not necessarily talking about expo and war and WPS over uh, all of these, you know, velocities and, and pitch and just baseball is just our, our MIT guys talking to each other and you got to, you know, be a member of Landa 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 and maybe you'll make a move and, and you can understand what they're talking about. But baseball totally it, to me is, is completely screwing itself out of its audience of people that he can't even understand what they're talking about anymore. Home runs aren't even home runs anymore. It depends on what the angle, the flight, and the expo was, the exit velocity. That counts for more than the fact that it was a home run. I don't get baseball. And Manfred, to me, is, is really hurting the game bad. Dolan, I'm going to go to back to your Revenge of the Nerds reference. Don't kid, don't kid me here, brother. You would have gotten a phone call from Alpha before Lambda. 
Well, certainly I would right. not have been a Lambda. Right. I, I, I didn't have the GPA for that. Uh, I'm not sure it would have been an Alpha Beta. I was just happy in my little Theta Xi, you know, corner of the world where, you know, we, we build swimming pools in the front yard, like we talked about last week with, uh, you know, Will's brother, or Will's dad. Well, I'll say this. I mean, based on, on Poindexter's green thumb, the, the Lambdas could party. Uh, <laughs> so Bill Dolman's with us, Pride of Fairbury, NBC Sports. Uh, he'll be on Olympic coverage here in one month. Bill, uh, this came into the Hale Varsity mailbag. I'm going to ask you, what is your favorite piece of sports memorabilia you own? Oh, well, I'll tell you, the one that means the most to me without question is uh, Calvin Murphy, uh, my good friend from my Houston Rocket days and the uh, shortest guy in the Hall of Fame. Um, He gave me one of his jerseys, Hall of Fame jerseys with his autograph. And I love Calvin dearly. And on the very last show that we did, everybody always told me that I needed to dress like Calvin because Calvin had the Craig Sager suits before Craig Sager. Craig Sager went to Calvin Murphy and said, I need to get some suits like yours so I stand out. So Calvin (laughs) set up Craig Sager. So people kept telling me I needed to dress like Calvin. Well, I never did until our very final show, and I put that Hall of Fame autographed jersey on on our final show. It was a tearful goodbye and a wonderful moment. But, uh, you know, that one means a lot to me. Um, You know, my national championship ring that I got my final year at Nebraska, Tom's final year, that was pretty cool. I've got a couple of jerseys and things like that. So, you know, that those those are pretty meaningful, as well as all the ribbons and medals I got from going unbeaten in the uh, Southeast Nebraska Swim League from uh, age 12 to 15. But that's another story for another time. (laughs) Bill Dolman's with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Bill, to talk some Husker football right now, you know, what what's your take on this team's mentality going into year four how how big a part of this success or whatever year four turns out to be will will hinge on on the team between the years well first of all i think it really comes down to how well taylor martinez plays um <laughs> that's that, that's critical i mean you got a guy who's going into his 11th collegiate season um i i think if uh if he plays well and plays like the veteran that he is, you know, look what happened to the Buccaneers with an aging quarterback. Uh, experience certainly matters. Um, that was really embarrassing last night, by the way, because not only did they not know who that guy was, but they didn't know who that guy was. And it was mm. somebody in the booth who must have said, I think that's Nebraska's starting quarterback. So Carl Ravitch had no idea who that was. Kyle Peterson didn't want to go there either. And that was, that was one of the most awkward moments of college world series baseball I have ever seen in my life. Now, what's the mindset of this team? Okay. I, I don't think this goes down to reading all the, the publications and the Athlons and the Phil Steels and all this about this, you know, Nebraska is not going to be any better. I, I don't think you can survive on bulletin board material. I never really believed that unless it's just really something incendiary where it really does rally everybody around. But if you're going to say, well, I don't think Nebraska is going to be very good this year. They're just going to win six games. Well, we're going to put that on our locker room. You know, well, I don't think that necessarily works. What I think does what should work. And they've got really big TVs with really big remotes at Nebraska. As I would put uh, pictures of the Illinois punter running waywardly for gaining 14 yards on a 45 yard run on that punt against Illinois last year, I would put, you know, losing, you know, leading Northwestern 20 to 13 and losing that game in the second half. Cause you weren't the stronger team, Illinois having two running backs gain over a hundred yards on you and running wild in the second half. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm all for highlight reels and pump up videos. And we had the best back in the nineties with Christian and Tony Beelan and those guys saying what they said. But if you can't show those guys video of, some of the most egregious breakdowns and say, you got to be better. I mean, if they don't take that to mind and heart, then you probably aren't going to have a very good year. But if I'm watching that Illinois punter run around for 40 yards to pick up a first down and nobody touches him or highlights, low lights of the Minnesota game where there are 33 players shy and you get beat at home. If that doesn't, you know, strike heart in the pride of this football team, then, then probably nothing is going to, I don't care what, what the public, you know, the, the writers say right now, what did you do last? And there are some moments where you've got to be better. And if you can't respond to being embarrassed a little bit, you know, go back to 90, what was it? 92, 93, 94, you know, that whole summer when they were working out, those guys had 18, 16 
116 on the scoreboard all summer long, losing to Florida State, having the lead with a minute plus to go, and losing the game. That was a motivator all year long. So there are ways to motivate that team between the years and strike at the heart uh, more so than what people think their prediction and what predictions are going to be. Bill Dolman's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, and Bill, with one of the harder uh, schedules in the country next year, on top of the fact that Vegas is only saying six wins for Nebraska this year, is just being motivated enough to get you over that six win mark and get you into a bowl game? Well, I, I think every, every indication is that this team has some talent. Right, and they they've certainly got experience now. It's not a freshman quarterback coming in. It's it's an eleven year guy who's been making apps for the past ten years. <laughs> but it, it's you know it, you've got experience at quarterback. You you need to develop some depth depth at quarterback. They got to hold on to the football. I mean, there's just some things like that. But the talent is there. Supposedly, this coaching staff has matured, you know, and kind of understands the position that it's in. I don't think it's a hot seat thing. But uh, I think this is time to kind of put it all together. And if you say, you know, it's only going to be six wins, well, maybe they, maybe you do take that to heart. I think it should be a, based on talent, a better than a six-win team. But, you know, they got to prove it. And, you know, they just can't sit there and play with, the, you know, PlayStations in that really nice locker room all the time. You've got to go out and get it done. And, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be getting done right now. I saw the video that Scott posted with, with Coach Osborne saying, you know, you won the majority of your games in August. Well, okay. Time to learn that lesson. He did pretty well by that philosophy. Bill Dolman's with us. Hail Varsity Radio Roadshow Thursday ahead of Texas, Virginia. The elimination game for the College World Series. And uh, Bevo could go home tonight. Maybe it's Virginia. We're here at Zipline uh, Brewery. Uh, incredible beer selection. Homegrown. Phenomenal. Nebraska beer. 721 North 14th. Bill, uh, before we get before we say goodbye, you got a prediction here with the CWS here. Who do you think we see on Monday? Boy, you know I'm like every everybody else in Nebraska when you when you attack yourself to the the underdog. So I I think that North Carolina State team kind of endeared itself to everybody down in Arkansas after coming what they got beat twenty one to one or something, and then yeah. to come back and win there and and to do what they've done to this point, I, I think everybody loves that underdog story and and you know Omaha just seems to be ripe for that each and every year. So I think NC State is is great. I know people aren't big fans of Texas. I get that, but you know I, I like their coach David Pierce, and they've got really good people on that program. So you know I, I, I don't want to say Texas, but I do like the people there. So uh, I could I could see Texas doing pretty well. Uh, I cannot believe what I saw last night with the kid throwing the wild pitch and then not even coming back. I mean that's the worst time to throw an 80 mile an hour ethos pitch and have it get stuck in the backstop. Uh, so I kind I kind of feel sorry for Stanford, but not really. And uh, Vanderbilt's just lucky to have survived. But I, I think everybody's kind of pulling for NC State and why not? Their coach seems to be pretty cool. Billy D, we'll see you soon. Thanks for the time, bud. Why are we not talking archery, modern pentathlon, and race walking? We'll do that next week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. He's in his 30s, but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hale Varsity Radio. I got the body of a taut pre-teen Swedish boy. Back into it, Hale Varsity Radio Roadshow here at Zipline of the College World Series. And uh, we check in with the pride of Chicago, Danny Burke. Burke's best bets, fresh off the bleachers from Wrigley. And uh, find Danny on Twitter at DannyBurke5. Listen to his show, Rush Hour, 6 to 7 weeknights on the VEASAN Sports Network. Uh, Danny, what's up, man? How are you? Schmitty, I'm doing good. You know, we're in the thick of this NBA postseason and I've uh, been having some good fortune coming our way with some prop bets and just overall NBA bets this week. So uh, looking to keep it rolling and taking advantage of betting the NBA while we still can. Postseason's going fast, my man. Yeah, and, and you are good about posting all of your results at Danny Burke 5, and you were 3 for 3 uh, the last couple of nights. Trey Young's been incredible. And I remember we were kind of talking about Trey Young and, you know, what's Oklahoma going to be like in the NCAA tournament with Young? You know, you, you go a few years back, and you've got just a wealth 
of of young talent that guys were picked high. You were kind of waiting on them to blossom, and boy, have they! What a what a job by Atlanta to go in and 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 get get a get a steal in game one against Milwaukee. Wow. How about it? And, you know, we were talking to uh, Aaron Bruski, who uh, works over at Hoopball on our show. And we were talking about this game. And, you know, the line was at H many. And he goes, you know, this is the biggest bet of the year for me. I'm not only taking the eight points with Atlanta. I'm betting them to win outright and betting them on the series. And the series price was like plus 350. And personally, I took the eight points with Atlanta. I didn't have the guts to say they'd win the whole thing outright. But, I mean, look at this team. I mean, my thought process Look, the series against the Knicks was a pick 'em, right? In terms mm-hmm. of the odds, and I and I felt that way even throughout the series. You know, you still had that thought that like every game, you don't know which way it's going to end, right? And you know, they win in five, but still, it wasn't like an easy series by any means. And then going up against the Sixers, I was Mr. Sixers saying that they'd win the East. And then after they lost game one, bet Philadelphia to win the series. Um, I'll be transparent with that. And it was just one of those things where it's like. You keep doubting this Hawks team, but at a certain time, you have to realize, hey, maybe they've just clicked and they're good. And that was my thought process for game one. Not only that, but for the fact that they were catching eight points seemed excessive, considering this Milwaukee team, A, does not have that good of an offense. B, their defense has improved in the postseason compared to the regular season, but it's not as good as it was in seasons past. And then also... Really, you know, they're kind of here by a stroke of luck, a couple stroke of lucks with the injuries because of Harden mm-hmm. and Kyrie. That doesn't mean that they can't beat the Hawks. It's just I think people are putting Milwaukee a little bit too high ahead of this Atlanta team, and we've seen them now snag two game ones in the opening series. And look, their offense is able to compete with anybody. They're a deep squad, and Trey Young is going to find a way to score, as we saw yesterday. I mean, the dude's just phenomenal, and – you know, we'll see what the spread is for game two, but I was pretty much like, hey, is this going to be a situation where we go, wow, like, you know, we, we keep doubting this Atlanta team and until they, you know, are up three games to one, then we're finally <laughs> like, okay, let's adjust like the point spread. So that was my thought too. I was like, okay, I want to jump on this sooner rather than later if it does get adjusted. So I took advantage of it and obviously that came through, but I'm not going to be surprised if Atlanta wins this series, Schmitty. No, they, they've got it going. McMillan's been nice. They've gelled. They are deep. They're talented. They're believing, most importantly. Danny Burks with us, Pride of Chicago, Burks Best Bets. He made out well with ATL last night. So uh, your take here on, on the Clippers and Suns game three, what a finish, first of all, for, for game uh, number two, are you surprised LA's hung in as long and as much? I mean, they've been close games, two really close games, obviously, uh, even without Kawhi. Does that surprise you? Um, yes and no, in a sense, because, you know, yes, in the sense, obviously, that like Kawhi is out and he's your main guy and that they're still finding a way to keep it close and win against the Jazz. But no, I guess, in the sense that, look, I think it's evident that Paul George plays a lot better when he has to be the guy, like we were accustomed to seeing when he was on the Pacers, not as much pressure and really gets to just, I guess, I don't know, just be completely free and just take as many shots as you want without having to consider giving it to another star player. So I think you're getting a better version of Paul George. And not only that, they still have a really deep team. And if you factor that in with a guy like Reggie Jackson making shots and heck, if Marcus Morris is making shots and yeah, it's going to be kind of hard to lose considering Jacks up every time he touches the ball. And if he's making most of it, then they're going to be obviously producing well offensively. But the main thing here, Schmitty, is that, they're not going to be able to keep it up statistically, right? I mean, this is a team that's taking a majority of their shots from beyond the arc, and while that's a specialty for most of these players, the Suns have such a great overall team and defense that matches up so well. So, you know, even if the Clippers theoretically do keep it up statistically, it's just not going to be enough to overcome the Suns team, especially considering now they're getting back Chris Paul, they're arguably best player on the team. So I think it's only going to be harder for the Clippers despite game three being at home. We'll see what happens. But, hey, I, I just don't see how you bet against the Suns at this point. Phoenix minus one, the over under at 221. Do you like either of those numbers? That seems pretty <laughs> pretty worry, worrisome, specifically the minus one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I get why some of the sharp money people in general may be wanting to go to Los Angeles. But again, look, you know, it's not like L.A. has the craziest home court advantage. Right. And then you're getting Chris <laughs> Paul. And then also at the same time, it's like, you know, 
after what happened in game two, it felt like that was a game, Smitty. If this team wanted any hopes of winning this series, they had to come through with that, right? Mm-hmm. And not only does Paul George, your top guy, you know, almost take away the narrative of pandemic P, playoff P by the having the chance of sinking those two free throws, but then you lose on a game winner like that. I think they kind of just screwed the pooch in a sense and the momentum's all toward Phoenix and that's the way I would lean. Again, it's nothing that I bet officially, but at this point, if you're telling me I have to bet one or the other, I don't think you can fade Phoenix right now. Danny Burks with us, the pride of Chicago. Burks, best bet. It's Hale Varsity Radio. Catch Danny on the VEASAN Sports Network. Weeknights, his show, Rush Hour, 6 to 7. iHeart Media, you can stream it. Also, several uh, hundred affiliates around the country. So, NHL, got about a minute and a half here. Golden Knights, Canadians. Uh, does it go to a Game 7, or is this magical, phenomenal season by the Golden Knights come to an end? Oh, Schmitty, they're killing me here. I'm still sweating out the 9-1 to futures ticket on them from about two and a half months ago. This series has been so frustrating because, look, I still believe and will die by this. I will die in this hill that VGK is a better team. <laughs> but you know how it goes in hockey, right? You catch a hot goal, you catch a hot squad in the playoffs, and they're just hard to overcome. And for some reason, it, it defies all the laws of hockey physics in my mind. The Canadians are doing well because this is a team I faded so much during the regular season, and they made me a good amount of money by doing so. But this playoffs are just doing so well. I, I Want to bet on VGK? I do, but I just honestly don't trust him. We'll see who's going to be in the net, whether it's Flurry or Letter, but. I think the better option, if you want to bet VGK, Schmitty, you just bet them to win the series right now at plus 165 as opposed to laying about minus 150. Because if they win this game, you got to assume, obviously, the momentum goes in their favor. Going back home, game seven, I'm going to trust them a little bit more, and you're getting value. So I would do that instead of laying the minus 148, minus 150 for just tonight. Danny, about 20 seconds. You got a baseball pick today? Uh, nothing that I've looked at as of now. I'm probably going to be waiting till the weekend when there's a little bit better pitching options. Mostly going to be focusing on basketball tonight, but of course we'll be going through some of those plays later on the show. Get uh, a hold of Danny Burke, uh, Rush Hour, 6 to 7, weeknights, VEASAN Sports Network, and uh, the iHeart Media app at Danny Burke 5 on Twitter. Pride of Chicago, good luck with your thoughts tonight, your picks this weekend, buddy. We'll uh, get a hold of you next week. Thanks for the time. Sounds like a plan. Appreciate you as always, Schmitty. And now. And now, back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time here at Zipline. It's Hail Varsity Radio Road Show Thursday here, just outside the College World Series. Uh, Virginia and Texas elimination game tonight. Reminder. Buckle on up if you're headed up to the CWS or you're headed to go see Deb the Spa. 80, 70% of people in fatal crashes in Nebraska not wearing a seatbelt. If used properly, seatbelts can and will reduce risk of fatal injury by 60%. Your best defense in any crash buckling up brought to you by the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. We say hi to Deb the Spa Lady, Home Innovation Spas, 20th in Highway 2 in Lincoln off Industrial Road, in Omaha and uh, spasonline.com. Deb, you, you've got that perfect spa to watch CWS action in, don't you? We sure do. And I've had a lot of people, you just talked about buckling up. I've had a lot of people say, you know, you just about could put uh, seatbelts in those hot tubs because they have <laughs> so much power. They just want to shoot you out of those seats. They really work those muscles in your lower back, your upper back, your feet. So, yeah, maybe maybe we do need to buckle up in a hot tub. I don't know. It might be the next next go-round we do. Deb will both strap in in the swim spa. <laughs> That's right. Definitely need that one. That one has really got some power. That will shoot you from the front of the spa to the back. And it'll keep you right in the middle so that you can swim, swim against the current, and then relax when you're finished. So it's the best of both worlds. Deb, the spa ladies with us, Home Innovation Spas, uh, 20th and Highway 2 in Lincoln, up here in Omaha, off Industrial Road, spasonline.com. Deb, tell folks uh, the selection you have, the pricing that is affordable, and, of course, the service after the sale. Yeah, we, we have the whole package. 
We have every size imaginable. We have financing lined up. We have our own electrician. We deliver it, set it up, uh, always there after the sale with the best service around. And we're local. This is our 31st year in business. So we aren't a fly-by-night that's going to come in and do a quick show over a weekend and then be gone. We're going to be here to help you out in the future. Deb, if folks want to come see you and pay a visit to you uh, and uh, check you out in Lincoln, 20th and Highway to the industrial location or just the website, uh, I'm sure that, that those are all three great options. But from an hours standpoint, if someone wants to see you during the week or weekend, you know, what are the hours? How do they get a hold of you? Well, I know I started preaching there for a moment, but yes, 10 to 6, Monday through Friday, 10 to 4 on Saturday, and our website is spasonline.com. No preaching at all, truth, right? That's awesome. <laughs> That's so good. Did you enjoy? Put your okay. feet up, get a, get a soak in, and watch some baseball. Uh, I Sounds like a great plan. Okay, Chris, thanks. Take care. All right, Deb. We appreciate you much. Deb is a lady. Hope Innovation Spa, 20th and I, too. If Elijah Herbal had sleeves, he'd roll them up. You're looking nervous. Yeah, it's looking it's looking dark out there, but you know I would never wear sleeves. got to show off the guns. Uh-huh. Elijah and, and, the, and the old gun show. Will Wilson, thanks for making this happen uh, back here at the studio. You too, Motsi. And, uh, hey, uh, high five, elbow bump, fist bump, whatever you want to do. Uh, another successful road show. Uh, back here on Monday with Hale Varsity, road show Monday to get the CWS Championship Series kicked off. And we're back at Zipline here, downtown Omaha, North 14th, 721. Elijah, good to see you. We'll have a good time uh, tonight and uh, back at you tomorrow with Hale Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery.